Okay, Susie's joined us, so that's uh, great. So welcome everyone. I'm gonna call the uh, Thursday, October 21st, 2021 meeting of the Hanscom Area Towns Committee, otherwise known as HATS uh, meeting uh, to order. And because we're on, in a virtual format, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, do a roll call for who's present. Um, let's see, uh, Jonathan? Sure, Jonathan Dwyer, select board member from Town of Lincoln. Thank you. Emily? Emily Mitchell, Select Board Bedford. Okay, and Susie? Susie Barry, Select Board Member Lexington. Okay, and myself, Linda Escobedo, Select Board Member from Concord. And Concord is the current host for the HATS Committee this year. All right, um, so let's see. Um, we, Glenn uh, Kurnuski is here from Hanscom, thank you. So uh, if you could give us an update, that would be great. My pleasure. And I'll try to keep this brief so we can get to our speaker. So uh, things are going well at Hanscom um, <clears throat> since the last time we met. Uh, we're still conducting a, a lot of teleworking. Probably half our workforce is still teleworking uh, considering the current situation with, uh, with COVID. Um, we've also adopted mandatory mask wearing while inside uh, buildings, unless you're alone in your office with the door closed. And, when somebody comes in, you're required to don your mask, or <clears throat> or if you're in your own residences, there it's that that's waived. So we're continuing that. So um, not quite back to normal yet. So, however, one thing that is happen, going to be happening normally this year is our uh, is trick or treating on Halloween. I'm happy to say. So the families will be going out on uh, on Halloween night, and our security forces squadron are actually uh, hosting a haunted house here on base for them and. Uh, they're, it looks like they're going to have a good time. So at least something is returning to normal. So <clears throat> um, we had a few visits recently, too. Um, we just recently hosted um, some staff members from U.S. Representative Seth Moulton's office. Uh, they came on the 13th of October to pay us a visit. Um, his uh, uh, Ms. Scheuler Moore, uh, his uh, senior defensive foreign policy advisor, came. Uh, his regional director, Mr. Norman Abbott. And as veterans liaison, Mr. Steve Vaughn paid us a visit, um, in, which included, you know, briefs on what we do at Hanscom. And uh, they also did a short wind, what we call a windshield tour, basically you drive around the base and look at the facility. So um, was, we have a really good reputation, uh, excuse me, relationship with uh, Representative Moulton and his team. So it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to, to host them and reconnect. So <clears throat> we also had another visit from... Uh, Someone recently on uh, September 29th, um, Hanscom's new honorary command chief, Mr. Tom O'Donnell, he's the senior director of the innovation initiatives at UMass Lowell, um, came to the installation and met with uh, our command chief, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Hebb, uh, and uh, came to learn a little bit more about the facility. He's only visited once before and it was a rather short visit. So this was good to get him here. He sat down with Chief Hebb and Colonel uh, Stevens, had a good chat with them gave him a good overview of the base. And then also uh, we did a windshield tour around the base and visited various facilities. And uh, they had a good conversation about future efforts and ideas to expand the par our partnership with them and build a nice long-term association. So it was a really good, uh, really good visit. And so, uh, really, that's, when, oh, when go ahead. Did, may I interrupt you briefly? Uh, did you say his title was Senior Director of Innovation Management? Did I correct yeah. you? Yeah, his, uh, his title is, let me get this right, the Senior Director of Innovation Initiatives. Mission. Uh, at UMass, okay. Yeah, thank at you. UMass, yep, UMass Lowell, and I think he uh, does some work at a Haverhill, the Haverhill uh -huh. campus as well. So, uh, and that was really it for my uh, my highlights. Um, if anyone has any questions, thank you for that. Um, are there also some oper command operations going on right now in terms of air air command operations? Oh, you're talking about like air. Oh, uh, not Air Force, but um, there is uh, some training going on utilizing the base. Um, Special Operations Command occasionally comes out and does uh, to various locales and does uh, aviation training, helicopter training. And that's, uh, that's happening right now. Uh, it started a couple of days ago and it's going to be continuing on uh, through, I believe, the 27th. They're not conducting training on Hanscom per se. They're just using the base to stage their aircraft and a fuel and all that. They're conducting their training, I believe in the Boston area. Okay, thank you. So, 
I sent out a, 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 me a memo was sent out to the town managers, just making them aware of this in case they get any, uh, any uh, requests or, or any com noise complaints. So there might be a little bit more activity, particularly at night, because they are doing night operations. So, but it's not saying nothing unusual. So when we have announcements like that in the future, is it possible to send it to the HATS committee members only because we also get questions? <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure to include you guys next time. Yes. <laughs> My apologies. Uh -huh. No, that's all right. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm. Um, any other questions for Glenn? Did you want Glenn to talk about the RAB from Monday, or did you want me to talk about? There's not too much to report, but um, either way, I'll I'll leave it to you, Emily. <laughs> before, right. just say, <laughs> Emily before you do that, I failed to. Yeah. Um, uh, are you, Jonathan, are you taking the minutes tonight? Yes, I am. Thank you. I, I failed to confirm that. I appreciate that. No Thank you. Sorry. Good, I'll I'm... stop scribbling. So sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Of course, I, don't, I don't have my notes right in front of me or, or easily at hand. So my... <laughs> I'm going to pass the buck this time. Okay. okay so I'm... there was a um, Hanscom Restoration Advisory Board meeting on Monday. Um, this is when we get the annual reports from the team of engineers, from the Army Corps of Engineers, from the Air Force, um, the EPA, Mass DEP. Um, about ongoing environmental restoration efforts um, at the Hanscom sites. And there wasn't anything, you know, particularly new or exciting to report. Um, a lot of the same mitigation me measures are happening. Um, there are several sites on the base and, and near the base that they're looking at. Um, there was a particular focus this time on um, PFAS, um, PFAS and PFOA, the um, sort of forever chemicals that we're now um, aware of um, and are in lots of things, um, but in terms of um, Hanscom, they're used in um, the AFFF firefighting foam. Um, that foam isn't used anymore, but it was used. So we're finding evidence of that there. Um, so there was a site inspection a couple of years ago. Um, they said that they discovered there were no complete pathways to water sources um, for the PFAS. So that's, um, at least some good news, but they're doing some expanded site, ex site inspections, including the Hartwell Well Fields, um, Shashin River, and the Jordan Conservation Area um, in Bedford. So that should be completed next month. Um, and those were the biggies that I took um, from the RAB. Did Perfect. I forget anything, Glenn? Nope, I don't think so. Um, I hesitate to admit this, but my audio for that meeting was lousy, so I, I probably missed a good one. One of the speakers was very quiet, so it was a little hard, yeah. There was that, and my own audio was breaking up a lot of times, so I was getting every fifth, uh, I was losing every fifth word. It was, it, it made it very painful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Emily or Glenn, can I uh, just ask at that meeting, um, were there some additional comments about um, pilot noise in the area? Because I know we've been getting calls about that. That wasn't really the place um, for that. HVAC did meet on Tuesday, which I can talk about now or later. And um, yeah, okay. I mean, it's it's nothing new. There were some new participants, new residents, um, you know, who who spoke at that meeting about um, concerns about increased aircraft aircraft noise. Okay. While well, you got the floor, why don't you um, go ahead with some highlights from HVAC if you don't mind? Sure. Um, so the November taxiway repaving project um, is basically done. They have a little bit of a punch list. Um, this was a you know, much smaller project than the um, runway repaving from a few years ago. And at, as far as I know, there were no significant complaints um, about trucking or anything like that. So that was, that was good. That was a good test case that we could do better um, than the last time. There are Significant concerns among some um, Bedford residents in particular about the proposed North Airfield redevelopment. There was an RFP that went out this summer um, and proposals are due back in mid-November. Um, so people in Bedford are concerned because the North Airfield is the part that's, that's closest to um, Bedford property. So it's basically right off um, Hartwell Road and it's you know proximity to local neighborhoods um, and there are concerns about increase in traffic, both air traffic and vehicle traffic. Um, the other thing that came up, so in terms of the North Airfield, there's nothing really to report until the proposals come back and we understand um, if there are any interested bidders, what they're interested in. Um, it would be limited to aviation use um, within that category. There are, there are lots, of, um, lots of different possibilities. 
There were also some renewed concerns um, about lead um, and you know, from leaded avgas, if that has seeped into soil and water, and if so, if it's affected um, surrounding towns. And you know, the tricky thing there is, you know, Massport will follow all environmental regulations that it has to, um, but it won't necessarily go above and beyond. And the towns can't really, you know, show up on Massport property and say we're going to test this place for lead. Um, so, you know, there are resident concerns. I don't know how um, extensive the actual problem is. And, you know, from the commission's perspective, we can raise those concerns in Massport and we do, um, but it's, you know, we're, we're sort of limited in, we don't have authority really over everything. Um, so that, that was about it from HVAC. I, I did notice that we had new people participating. Usually we have kind of the same um, three or four residents who show up all the time. Um, and, um, so it was interesting to have some new faces there and, and not just Bedford people too. We have people from Lexington and uh, Concord as well. Uh, when was that, Tuesday? Good, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Glenn. All right. I have a question for Emily. Did, was the thought that the, uh, the noise due to aircraft were the same, same noise that we've been, that have been complained to to HVAC for a while? So it's, it's tough it's to different. say, I mean, if you look, at historical data, air traffic at Hanscom is significantly less than it was 10 years ago, significantly less than it was 20 years ago. And in that time, the types of aircraft have also changed. So like the really noisy aircraft just aren't allowed anymore. Um, there have definitely been a significant increase in complaints. Part of that is due to the air noise button, which is this technology that was developed by a guy in California. You basically get a little button that's connected to Wi-Fi that identifies like the nearest aircraft in the air, you, you tell it which airport you're close to, and it sends a complaint automatically, electronically to, um, to Massport. I think part of the increase in that is because it's easier now. You know, you don't have to find the phone number and make a phone call. You don't have to go through the um, online system, which is pretty cumbersome and, and um, not super intuitive. So I think whether or not there are more complaints or whether more people are making the complaints. You know, you could have 600 people who are upset and three of them make a phone call. Well, now maybe you have 600 people who are upset and 300 of them press a button. Um, it's a little hard to, to determine that. Okay. Just anecdotally, I can tell you that the um, several um, complaints that came to my attention, they didn't know anything about being able, even how to register the complaint. Yeah. So they were coming in, you know, without technology benefit. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the other thing is, you know, traffic was significantly down last year. So when we get the monthly noise reports, they, they compare year over year. So you're not comparing February to March, you're comparing last March to this March. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of planes in the year in 2020 and we have a lot in 2021. So people really noticed that. Um, so I think it's just, um, I think that's part of it as well. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we still do not have a, a Massport um, representative uh, at these meetings. And so uh, we'll see how that proceeds going forward. <laughs> All right. So I see our speaker is here. And so I want to welcome um, David uh, Lautzenheiser. How are you? Welcome. You're on mute, I think. Let's try that. How about that? Very good. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. Buttons here. Me, Thank you very much, Linda. Let me just um, give a brief introduction. And um, I don't know how long ago this was written, so you may need oh, to. It's, you can skip. I'll, see, I'll do the introduction. That's OK. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the long-winded MAPC. You know, I was born in a hospital on a. <laughs> <laughs> in a room somewhere <laughs> i went to this and that school uh, it's okay if you, if you do you really want to do your own yeah I, i'll just that's fine i don't we don't need to read the the bio um i i'm david lotson as i'm a transportation planner at mapc and and as you all know you're all part of the mapc region you know we have 101 cities and towns um most of you are part of the magic subregion, and, and you're probably involved in, in some way shape or form in, in the subregion. um and, and again, I'm a transportation planner. I focus primarily, not exclusively, but 
a lot of most of my work is is on cycling and walking and and the infrastructure to 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 really build that out and I was going to, I'm going to use partially a joke. If you all know the Tokyo Narita airport, which, which was built what 30, 40 years ago. And, and it was the, they didn't, they still don't have the land for a full runway. their, their second runway um, because of, you know, have minute domain. And so they've got, they had a short runway and, and, and so they couldn't land the, the, the wide bodies in any case. Um, the, the point being that our, our bicycle and pedestrian network is is full of those examples of it's not connected it's not you know there's there's a lack of sidewalks everywhere there's there's you know a lack of bicycle facilities but yet there's some good examples of of good corridors that people use and and so our goal is to connect that up to create a continuous conti or contiguous network of quality cycle and walking facilities uh, throughout the region. And so we've done that. We've created a plan and I'll talk about the plan and we've created, you know, uh, things like that. So I don't, Linda, I'm, I just, I'm jumping forward in the, in the presentation. Is it, should, did you, is there anything else you wanted to say? Sorry, before I keep. Well, you, uh, you were very keep... modest about your background <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you certainly have had um, a varied experiences. You've been with MAPC for quite a while, it looks like. And, um, and, uh, and your other experiences in terms of, um, urban uh, planning and uh, have been very helpful. So um, go ahead as you would like to proceed. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I will go through through a shortish slide deck, 15 minutes or so, and then it would open up discussion um, and talk about, um, okay, so, Okay, all right. Um, we're gonna talk about the Metro Boston Greenway Network, uh, otherwise known as we know, call it a landline. Um, and I'll get back to this picture in a bit. Um, just some of our history since I've been in MAPC, I've been with MAPC about 12 years, is that 10 years ago, we put out an interactive trail map because I think part of the first goal was to understand where we have places to walk and bike you know, the, the Google maps and or even the, the, the paper maps that preceded that had great, they show all the roads, but they don't show all the trails, don't show where all the bike paths are or the shared use paths are, the rail trails. Um, and, and, and so this was our goal to create this, this, this um, um, map that, that shows all of these facilities and where you can walk and bike and your dog and your baby stroller and you know, whatever piece of equipment you're using when you're not in a car to move around the city or the, the parks. Um, that's the goal of, of, of trail map, which is the, the screenshot on the right. We created a map print map for two years. Then we went back to the digital. Um, in 2015, we went through a branding process to look at how, how we were going to name the regional network, as it were, uh, landline. We put together a vision plan in 2018, and we're moving forward with that. And then a, a, a more focused online map, landline map that just focuses on those high priority corridors. Uh, again, the, the, so the, the, the landline network is sort of the curated or highest priority or, the, or the, so the top level network. Think of like the interstate highway system in relation to the other highway network because it's sort of the top level um, corridor. And this is how we see the sort of the regional uh, landline network as part of the, the sort of the top level uh, system. Um, you know, our role in, in developing this network, you know, we've developed the vision in branding or we're, we're, you know, we've got, you know, web components and mapping, as I mentioned. Um, my role and many of others roles are to really work with each of the communities to, to identify the specific corridors and then to create um, to, to advance those particular corridors um, and, and engaging with various communities and, 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 and specific segments along the way uh, and the coordination. And we also have the Landline Coalition, which is a group of interested people and you all are welcome to join that we meet once every month or so and have topical discussions on either specific segments or specific topics. The last meeting we held a few weeks ago, we focused primarily uh, specifically on funding for projects. Um, tomorrow, look at the 
your favorite news source. And this photo at the right will have some major news we hope to report on. This is pretty exciting uh, about uh, a bridge that's about to be built here. So Ooh. come back, read your papers tomorrow. And <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Uh, we, we, we're still getting the news on that. So um, keyword, Governor Baker. So anyway, multiple regional uh, efforts. Um, you know, in addition to, I'll start sort of high up, you know, outside of Massachusetts and sort of the presentation will go, you know, outside Massachusetts, then, then sort of MAPC and then Hanscom region. So, you know, we're working with multiple partners to, to look at trail networks throughout the area. This map on the upper right is, is, is our effort with the Rails for Trails Conservancy and many other partners to create a regional rail trail network throughout New England. Um, and that's what that map is. It's not every rail trail, but it's sort of the key ones that create to make make uh, the network. Uh, at the bottom is the Mass Central Rail Trail, which is one of the signature trails in the state that were, there's a lot of effort to complete that and bring that uh, 100 mile trail uh, to completion. Um, basically the, the green segments are those that are complete and the red segments are not. So. There you can see kind of where where we are in, in the development of that. Um, you know, prioritization for advancement of corridors, at least in terms of our efforts at MAPC, it's it's closing the gaps of the regional network, um, and that means connecting to the obvious locations. You can also add airports to that. Um, well, there's basically two in the region, two significant airports in the region. Uh, serving low-income communities, of course, um, advancing or, you know, where there's support at the local community to advance segments. And then the very important one, and this is always the challenge, is, is, is the available right-of-way to, to build these uh, specific uh, regional trail corridors. Um, this is the vision map that we put out in, in 2018, um, and, and I'll talk about the, the types of corridors in that area. And this is covers the entire region, but essentially the dark green corridors are those that are uh, complete and the light green are those that are envisioned. And then the red are the regional trail networks, the regional sort of hiking trail networks. And the vision plan we divide into two broad types of corridors. The greenway corridors are those that are accessible to all types of users. They have a they have a wide, stable, firm surface. So it's basically accessible to wheelchairs, to strollers, to all types of bikes and, and so forth. Um, um, those greenway quarters could be such as we see at the top, that's one of the aqueduct trails, um, or it could be um, you know, low traffic streets or, or so forth. And, and the other sort of segment are the, are the foot trails, which are you know, the Bay Circuit Trail runs through right through your region is, is the prime example. Primary goal there is, is a natural experience of a trail through the woods. Sometimes it runs on local streets as well, but, but that's sort of, the, those are the, the two, sort of the binary is Greenway, which is hard, stable, accessible, and then foot trails, which is natural. And, and the ideal for both of these scores is, is to be separate from traffic uh, as much as possible. So I'll talk about so the first part, which are the greenway corridors, the the typology of what we would like to see, what type of um, what that corridor would be. Um, on the upper left, uh, shared use path, rail trail. This is the Minuteman Trail. On the lower left is a similar shared use path, but in this case, it's directly connected to transit. So we have, um, you know, this is the Blue Line in East Boston. Um, there are other examples of, of rail trails along the uh, Somerville community path, which will open in May, June, July, August next year, who knows, <laughs> part of the Green Line extension, um, and, and many other examples. Um, you know, we're looking at, and I'll talk a little bit later, we're looking at potential opportunity along the Fitchburg line in, in Acton and Concord. Um, on the upper right, you know, m we're also looking at um, you know, again, we want separation possible. In some cases, we don't have that ability to separate, but a low traffic, low density residential street like the one in the upper right, which I think is in Framingham, but it's typical of, of many streets where it's not a through street for traffic, but it, but it serves the, the neighborhood, the community. It's not striped with lines and high speed. It's, it's, it's a very low speed. 
Then on the bottom right is the is sort of the ideal urban context solution where you have a, a, a protected bike lane at the sidewalk level, a sidewalk, and, and then the buildings. And you know, this is downtown Boston, but it could also be Concord Center, it could be, you know, it could be you know, Lexington Center, Mass Ave there, you know, it could be, you know, any sort of urbanized context that, that, that does not have to be in, in the big, uh, you know, in the cities itself. And I just want to expand more on, on shared streets. Again, and I showed you a sort of a subdivision street, and this is more of a street like you might see, you know, in Concord, for example, or, or any, any of those, uh, let's see, Concord and, and in parts of Bedford, is just a, a lower traffic street that people were walking in the middle of the street. And we want to be able to encourage that use of that street as a slow street where drivers are the guests and, and the priorities for the people that are on foot or bike. And, and these two examples just show that. Um, this is a really ideal urban example. And I'm, I'm kind of a design nerd. So I just wanted to show this example in, in Brookline that has all the elements of good design of a street that accommodates all types of users. Uh, just some of the elements that I see that are important to, to consider. Um, bike share is nice, obviously. That's difficult in the suburbs. We can certainly talk about that. Um, sidewalks that are separated from, from the street as much as possible with street trees. Here we have a um, um, sidewalk level protected bike lane. On this side, we have a street level bike lane. In some cases, the reasons, space or whatnot to have one or the other. We have a raised crossing here. So the pedestrians have priority crossing this intersection as the crossing is at the sidewalk level. So the drivers are coming up to that sidewalk level. They're on a, a rough surface, you know, a, a textured surface. That, that, that talks about, that focuses on pedestrians. So just give me an example of design. I think I've shown that picture already. Um, in the Hanscom area, this is, I'm gonna show two maps of the, the regional network. And, um, you know, the dark green are the corridors that, of this regional network that are complete. And the light green are those that, that we uh, are proposing uh, for this network. I would probably want to add Hanscom Drive to this. That might be a good sort of stub in to get into Hanscom right in here. I know there were there were plans to 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 narrow that roadway at one point and put bike lanes on there. So I'd be interested to know, you know where that is. Um, and of course the intersection of two-way is, is is a topic of discussion. Um, you know, and I'm sure you're involved in that. Um, and then um, now I'll talk about some of the segments here in a minute. Uh, so this map shows, uh, and the red lines are the the foot trails, the hiking trails. Uh, the, the, this is all pretty much the base circuit trail here, and I think the base circuit goes in two different directions here. It also goes in two different directions through through Lincoln and, and Weston. Um, let's see. I'm going to advance to. This is the same map, but it's just busier. <laughs> um, and and the difference is, it's the same map and the same lines on the map, but the difference is that we show what the type of, what the quarter looks like. The dark green are rail trails, you know, the Minuteman Trail, uh, the, the, the dark green are surfaced and the light green are, are unsurfaced like the section in Concord. Um, the, the brown sections are, are that shared low traffic roadway section, uh, like is it Mill Street that comes through between Lexington and, and Lincoln there up to up to the to two A, um, and then the the dashed yellow lines are sort of are gaps that that we see. Like for example, we want to connect from you know the end of the Battle Road Trail into Concord Center, but there's not the space to have a sidewalk. There's a sidewalk, but have a nice bike lane of bike trail or some sort that that's separate from traffic. So that's why that's in this this, this yellow sort of dash is is, is a gap section. Um, so the final slide, which I will just run through relatively quickly, and then, um, and actually I'm, I'm gonna show you that slide, that list, these are the key gaps that I've just sort of put together. And, and through your, your, your comment and discussion, we can talk about whether that's a good list or we need more than that. I'm gonna go back to this map and, and, and sort of read out. The first, and these are in no particular order, 
uh, there's six that I've, or five that I've listed, and I'll just run through those on the map where those are uh, sort of key gaps of connecting that trail network. One is um, uh, connecting the Bruce Freeman Trail with the Miniman Trail. The Bruce Freeman Trail is the north-south trail that runs from Lowell and eventually all the way to um, Framingham. And, and right now the big construction, as you probably know, is the Route 2, the bridge over Route 2, just past the uh, uh, Concord Rotary. Uh, so that's under construction and that'll open uh, next year. And that's a huge uh, gap to be um, closed uh, when, that, when that bridge is open. Um, and so the connecting the Minuteman and Bruce Freeman, and, and part of that is um, as, as early as next year, and some of you from Bedford can say, will know the exact timing, but that's supposed to go out to bid pretty soon and be built uh, surface and rebuilt uh, through Bedford on the Minuteman Trail all the way to the, to the Concord line. Um, Concord, I don't think is interested in doing the same and, 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 and my, my sense they like the surface as is. And, and, and then from there, there's, there's an opportunity perhaps to bring it all the way to the, the Barrett's Mill or Barrett's Farm with a couple bridges and, and a lot of it's in the public way, right of way, but not 100% of it. But that would be a great opportunity if that were to be connected all the way to the farm, because that would then provide an opportunity to connect further. Um, but, but if not, there's you know, maybe other ways to connect through Davis Road, is it? Would be a bridge over Route 2 here. But that might be a while since you're just building one to the west. So I don't know. Um, the second um, the key quarter I mentioned in, in that list previously is uh, um, Lexington Center to the Battle Road. So that's Mass Ave coming up the hill here. Um, that's a key sort of desire line. Um, the road is striped a bit strange, and it could be done in a better way to accommodate bikes uh, there, 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 there are sidewalks on that road um, third third uh, gap is the battle road to Concord Center as they mentioned you know the battle road is a really nice windy path through the national park but it ends I guess abruptly we're at the park boundary and sort of connecting you know in, into Concord Center um, crossing route two and and this this is probably one of the biggest most difficult gaps to, to deal with. Um, in, in terms of creating a regional trail or greenway network, our goal is to, is to when crossing the interstate highways that we're using roads that are not at interchanges because it interchanges with high speed on and off ramps. So having Mill Street you know, in Lexington over here is great because you can go under 95 and it's a very popular route for cyclists for that reason. Um, if you would head up to you know, up to, you know, Bedford Street, it's an interchange and obviously the Minuteman Trail is there to, 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 to is, is a better option, but, but in many cases that that's not the case. So you're kind of stuck on Trapello Road, for example, going through that interchange uh, when you're biking uh, down Trapello Road or walking down Trapello Road. It, it's sort of the character of that roadway. Um, so, and the other piece is, is on a Route 2, it'd be ideally not crossing at Route 2 at grade because most of those vehicles are driving at 60 miles an hour and they're you know, careening to a stop at the light, hopefully when it turns red, they may slip one or two as it turns yellow and red. But um, so it's, it's an area of safety concern for vulnerable users, cyclists and pedestrians. So if there's a way to cross Route 2, not at um, an at grade light, then that's ideal. The, the um, was it across with the 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 project a couple of years ago at, at the Concord Lincoln Line, um, you know, it, it provided a great separation, but did not provide a connection, for example, to Sandy Pond Road. So, you know, our, our goal is to 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 look at ways to go from Sandy Pond Road up and over and into into Concord Center, and then finally, and I mentioned obviously as a as a Hanscom committee, is that um, you know, connecting through Hanscom Drive and then over up to the north. There was uh, on Virginia Road, a um, death of, of a cyclist collision with the vehicle several years ago. So there's always a concern about cycling safety in, in that area. So that's my presentation, but let's open that up for questions. And 
you know, I, I just sort of, yeah, let's, let's, you know, please, any questions or, or comments, I'll be happy to, to uh, have a discussion. I'm not sure where to start, so maybe you all can. So I think, thank you for that. I, th I think it's good that you've laid out um, in, in this quick overview, um, some of the challenges uh, that you see, as well as uh, we are getting feedback as an example in Concord um, that they want to leave the reformatory. There are a, a large group of people who want to leave the reformatory trail as is, uh, just because of the ecological um, and environmental uh, value of the uh, wildlife refuge that it goes through. As, so, you know, um, even before there's any discussion and having that on the table necessarily, already there was a groundswell of, uh, of uh, people commenting on this or, or contacting uh, their officials in town, just even hearing about the uh, pavement project in uh, potential pavement project in Bedford. So what, what I think is important about key trails like the reformatory branch is that it has a hard accessible surface um, and it doesn't have to be asphalt it can be a stone dust or there's a dirt or you know something it, like it is now but but you have drainage issues and you have messy you know water when it's when it's wet and so building a surface that's that's drains the water better and creates a you know better surface to to ride on to walk on would would, would be the direction I, I would see with, without using that asphalt word in, in your conversation, because that that's that's obviously the public Concord public doesn't like that now, and that, that that's okay. You know, there's there's other ways to to improve the trail without going that route. Questions or comments from others? I'll go. Jonathan, yeah. Good to see you, David. Jonathan. You too. Yep. Um, so you mentioned uh, connecting Lexington and the Battle Road path. Um, I remember there being shadows, like there's Lex, there's Mass Ave, and there, there were striped with shadows pretty, a pretty long time ago. I, you know, we didn't have shadows. I didn't see shadows very frequently. And then Bed, uh, Lexington had shadows and quite a few install implementations. So uh, is the vision for something and, and I'm, I'm asking this question on behalf of Lincoln because I'm wondering what the future might look like for say Chapella Road going across um, 128. Uh, so with the Sharrow idea, with the Sharrow implementation in Lexington, would you characterize that as like not enough for a safe passageway for uh, people, vulnerable road users, pedestrians and such? Yes, I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think, well, shares are better than nothing because they sort of announced that there's cyclists in, in, in that could be using that roadway. On that particular roadway, I would, there was not space to do, I don't think to do, I don't remember, I measured it a while ago, a couple of years ago, but I don't think there was space to do bike lanes in both directions and the two travel lanes. So, so in that case, having a full bike lane in the uphill section, um, and there are several hills in that section and, and the downhill section be a shadow, you know, sort of striping changes that that would be much better for, for the users by doing simple adjustments in the striping, I think would be, would be the, the solution there. Um, I mean, there could, you could also narrow the roadway and create a two way path on one side that could be possible. You know, they're, they're, they're I mean, that's a big, you know, construction project, but but within the current pavement, it could be restriped to have the bike lane on the uphill section and you know a share on the downhill. Thank you. Have you have you given any observation thought around the Trapella Road crossing of 128? What that might be like or if or if Waltham has been talking with MAPC about uh about these corridor plans? Yeah no I mean the that interchange, as with all interchanges, is mass shot control. Mm -hmm. So the key to to that is is when they are repaving that section, to have that conversation with mass dot and how to make that better. Unfortunately, it's not. They do make some changes, like they may put in. You know, often the sidewalks are not in, in great repair, and the, the the crossings are a challenge or not repaired or not maintained. But like to me, the best thing is to 
you know, this cl clover leaf makes you come off at a pretty high speed onto, you know, for example, Trapella Road there. And, and if you could change that to be a right angle and you're, you're stopping at a light or a stop sign and you're making a right turn instead of flying off that at, you know, 40 miles an hour and you're merging with, you know, the vulnerable users that are coming across that. Uh, that to me is the, the solution to change the geometry of how that, you know, to a T section instead of that on off ramp type of situation, um, which we see far too often. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. So David, if I can use that um, discussion as an example, at, are you guaranteed to be have an opportunity to intervene in that discussion the minute that goes on DOT's uh, repavement schedule or how does that work? If we find out, we often can provide input. Um, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. number, number of advocates when MassDOT repaved uh, the intersections of Route 2, Waltham Street, uh, a couple others in Lexington, uh, they, they found out and, and, and got to the table and, and, and MassDOT, you know, put in bike lanes at, you know, for example, Waltham Street in particular last year. Um, but sometimes we don't always, always get that, that opportunity. And, and the, the repaving projects are sort of low hanging fruit because that's happening and that's an opportunity to rethink the total cross section in that repaving project to, to see what can be done to provide safety for everyone and redo crosswalks and maybe curb ramps and sort of all those, those, those maintenance items that, that, you know, because you're repaving, you're making it easier and faster for drivers. Um, so you also need to accommodate the other users uh, on the road as part of that. So the key is being at the table and, and, and Jonathan can, can speak to the two-way project, you know, and, and the, you know, the, the town is actively working with mass thought on, on, on the outcome of that. So um, and that's a good example of, you know, the partnership of the communities, you know, pushing for what they want and sometimes we're involved as well. Okay. What I'm learning yep. from your comments is that the bicycle and pedestrian organizations in each of our towns should keep an eye on yep. the highway list of projects. So when something comes up, we're yep. more likely to find out about it earlier. I mean, I mean, as, you know, my, my role and, and our role is that 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 the that the users are you know it's not just the DOT projects, but it's the DPW. They're they're doing right. projects all the time, and that that that. That you, the right committees and the people and those you number of elected officials are at the table here and, and just being, you know, being involved and, and at the right time and, and institutionalizing, institutionalizing the process of making those those comments. You know, I, I in where I live, um, we have, there's a bicycle committee, a pedestrian committee, a transit committee, and they review every single road project that comes in. They review all the major development projects. The large building projects. This is Cambridge, and 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 provide input on those projects before they are, you know, complete. So there's a there's a process for each of those committees to provide that that input uh, to the projects, whether it's the city doing it, or whether it's a large developer that's putting in an office building, or a uh, you know before they go for the zoning board and. Uh, to to prove those projects, so it's the institutionalization of that process that that's critical. Um, so I don't know if this is related exactly, but um, the two A improvement project, for example, um, we have various groups who have, um, as they learned about it, then provided feedback for that in the process, uh, and and the and the surrounding towns may have different objectives that they're trying to accomplish with that mm -hmm. improvement project. And um, we, we learned that um, because there are federal funds involved, there was a federal process in terms of community engagement that needed to be activated and so forth, which hadn't necessarily occurred in the right order or maybe had not happened exactly. And we then, uh, our Concord Historical uh, Commission of all committees mm -hmm. um, requested um, to be at the table. And in fact, we were made, we are now made a consulting partner on that project mm -hmm. um, because it's not only a gateway for the national park, but it's a, um, a gateway in a sense uh, for people coming to Concord for all the historical resources. Mm -hmm. So we had a, um, maybe we have a slightly different vision of what 
also needs to be done in that section. So I think you just um, you've just illustrated for me where I uh, in a similar manner what we're trying to do. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't talked about two way vision wise, but um, I'm just 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 saying that that you know being at the table and and you know I I think I I think the the key elements of two way are. You know, providing safety for cyclists and pedestrians, retaining the historic character that's there as much as possible, given there's also a major airport <laughs> next to it, and but there is a national park and you know some of the historic features like walls and fences and, and that sort of thing, but also having safe crossings for pedestrians, that's critical in a roadway of that speed. So you know you've got you've got to do both and, and they're 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 all they're all important elements to 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 that. Um, so yeah, that's, so you, yeah. Yeah, you reminded uh, remind me of that process. So thank you. Um, other questions or comments? Emily, did I see your hand? I did. Um, so a, a couple things. First, I was interested in um, your comments and Linda's comments about the reformatory branch um, trail and the repaving because there there was and is you know opposition in Bedford to to paving it. There are. Um, a number of constituents who really feel like it should stay as, um, you know, the natural stone dust. And um, for for me, like I, I like the stone dust myself when I'm walking. Um, but what sort of changed my mind is is the accessibility part of it. You know, where you could have somebody who's using a wheelchair who's using that. So I'm, I was interested to hear that. You know, it's not necessarily asphalt. It needs to be a hard surface that drains well, and there are um, other possibilities there. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about. Um, how you deal with resistance, particularly when it comes to things like bike lanes, protected bike lanes. Um, you know, we had some interest in Bedford in trying to put a protected bike lane on the Great Road, which is our major thoroughfare through the center of town um, mm -hmm. and sort of brought that up to um, business community, to, to residents and abutters. And it was pretty clear like, nope, nope, there's no room. We don't want to give up any space. There's no space to do this. There's already too much traffic. And it was just, it was a very clear, like, this is not something that, um, that we're interested in. And um, how, how, do you, how do you sell a project like that to a community? Um, yeah, I, so as I recall, Great Road is like four lanes and you're probably trying to reduce it. To, it's to, two lanes. Yeah, it's, it, it is two, okay. Yeah. I think there's four in places or there it's, might be. It's three in a couple places. Yeah, yeah. there's like a okay. turning lane. Um, yeah, on the yeah so this, this was, I mean, it's understanding what the opposition is. Is it is it real? I mean, in a sense, is it? You know, I I I, I almost like to bring all parties in, into the room and have a conversation of what's important to them. You know, I think, you know, I, I think it's you know if everyone's heard, if if you know two A, we've got the historical content and the safety content. You know, we have, you know, we have all those those pieces together. You know, I think that's as an example that that. You know, it's having that conversation before it becomes this sort of, you know, what was it that that sort of sort of like yes or no or A or B, and it becomes politicized and polarized. And you know, I think I think the early discussions that are not ground in early solutions, but more that we want to improve bicycle safety, we also need to accommodate traffic flow. And let's start the conversation and have the different parties in the room to have that conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm hopeful the, the conversation is not over. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. I think this is something that we're gonna go back and, and um, you know, continue to explore. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the other um, like traffic calming measures? Um, you know, if that's, if that's part of um, yeah. what you do with the Greenway. I think um, we have our bicycle advisory committee and our transportation advisory committee are working on developing a policy with the DPW for, you know, what's the town policy on traffic calming? What are some of the options that we want to have on the table? Can you talk some about, about those? You mean, what are specific elements that we look at? Yeah. Um, and and yeah. where they would be. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think of a no, number of elements, you know, number one, well, I, I'd say crossings, you know, crossings having a median eilage, median island, uh, 
so that pedestrians, particularly at a, what we call mid-block crossing or crossing that's not at a signal, or even at signals for that matter, you, you're, you're crossing that lane of traffic. You have that island where you can stop and then you can move to the next side. Um, you know, Lincoln put in a crossing by the Audubon um, on 117 by, um, by um, not Great Brook Farm. Is it Lincoln Road, Carbon Farm down there? Carbon Farm, yeah. Um, you know, so so that's a that's a example of because there's that island that the traffic is slowing and the crosswalk's visible and pedestrians are able to cross in, in a much safer manner than if it's just sort of free flow because you're crossing one lane uh, at a time. Um, yeah, um, speed humps I mentioned in that one of the first pictures, which is the raised intersection at crossings. Um, um lane width lane width yes absolutely um there are standards to bring it down to as low as 10 feet is perfectly acceptable in most cases and often roads are are, are, are narrower than that um roundabouts not rotaries but roundabouts modern roundabouts i think are, are often a much better solution than, than traffic signals in the appropriate location uh, because roundabouts you know, traffic signals are kind of a pulse. You know, you, you go from, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour to zero, you wait, and then you go speed up again and, and you, you head off. Whereas with a roundabout, you're coming in at a slower speed, you're yielding to the pedestrians and cyclists, and then you continue. It's, it's, it's much more efficient, you know, in, in that sort of, you know, context where there's basically, particularly one lane roundabouts where you, where you can do what we call a modern roundabout and, and really, continuous flow of traffic, but also slow enough that there's safety for, for other users on the roadway. So we've I, talked I, about roundabouts in a couple of places and there's one particular yeah. intersection in town where I think there's renewed interest in exploring mm. that because um, there was a um, pretty serious bike accident recently um, mm. with a car where just the car didn't realize who had the right of way and sort of made a left turn right into the cyclist. Um, yeah. And it's, but it's, you know, in a historic place and whatever, you know, easements and takings might have to happen. Um, you know, those are pretty fraught conversations. But. Yeah, you know, even a single lane roundabout needs like a hundred feet of, of width and diameter to, to make it happen. But there's also, there are also many roundabouts in, in lower traffic streets that, that can also be used in certain places. So it's, again, again, there's the context of, of you know, what that is, where it is, um, so. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Same topic, but I have a question. Do, do each of our towns have a bicycle pedestrian committee and a traffic committee? We have a bicycle advisory committee and a transportation advisory committee. And they meet separately and then they meet jointly um, four times a year. But we don't have a specific traffic committee. We have bicycle and transportation safety and they meet separately. I don't know if they ever meet jointly. They should. And then, and then we have an internal working group that does, you know, the staff that does work with traffic. And, and they're connected to both, the traffic is connected, excuse me, the staff is connected to both of those committees? Yes. Who does Concord have? Uh, Concord has a transportation committee with a bicycle subcommittee and then internal work, you know, internal staff working on this. Um, right now, those committees, and we have also have a Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Committee, yeah, yeah. Um, which is staffed. Um, and the Transportation Committee is just getting rebooted. So I uh, I'm not sure what the staff connection will be for that committee yet. Interesting. We've got a, uh, a Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee and then we have the roadway and traffic um, uh, advisory committee, and they were separate, and now they're they're more and more and more working together on this, looking at the same plans, whether it be a, a roadside path or road treatments. It's yeah. it's been a good, it's been a merge, it's been a good merging of the people and their interests. When before a couple of years ago, they may have been. They may have had different opinions, or just like that's you, this is us. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's completely. So are, st are staff working closely with those? Two yeah, the, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. The roadway traffic committee has somebody from, uh, or our DPW director and our chief of police 
and um, off uh, zoning uh, planning board. That, I guess that's it. And the, and the bicycle pedestrian also has a police officer on it. Do you find that your um, bicycle committees, and this is sort of a question for everybody, tend to cater to a particular kind of cyclist or do you try to keep it broad? I see Bob Wolf shaking his head. Bob Wolf is actually the chair of the co-chair of our bicycle pedestrian advisory committee. Bob, do you um, wanna? Sure, um, uh, I think we're trying to, we recognize that there are uh, several types of cyclists. Uh, I tend to be among the crazy spandex wearing sort, even though I'm probably too old for that. Um, uh, the, but I think that actually our targeting in our current work uh, on a master plan has been more to what we've called family cyclists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, folks who, if it's a busy road, would rather take the, uh, the sidewalk or the roadside path, uh, making sure that they've got safe access to uh, the institutional corridor of town um, uh, and then access out, since we don't have a rail trail, and don't have one planned, uh, safe access to um, uh, the Minuteman or the Bruce Freeman or um, the Mass Central. Thank you. I'm sorry, Linda, I should have asked your permission for before inviting somebody else to speak. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Um, actually, I, I don't know if uh, Glenn wants to um, comment on this, but in rereading the minutes for tonight, uh, for later tonight that we're going to discuss, um, I noticed that um, Colonel Stevens talked about with the new security measures at Hanscom um, that any trails so forth uh, uh, that they were now had to think about the trails in two very distinct ways, those that were within the perimeter of the fence fencing and those that were outside of the fencing. And so, um, Glenn, do you have any more that you can say about that? I don't actually, but I can definitely address that and ask that question higher. Um, of course, Air Force regulation is gonna play a big part and of course security obviously for the obvious reasons. So, yeah. um, I, I just happened to come across that reading the minutes today that the, the Colonel had commented on that. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'll shoot that question higher. So this is something we definitely need to consider. Okay. Any other questions or comments uh, while David's here? Take advantage of his expertise. David, how how uh, um, is your department prioritizing projects in terms of the help that gets focused locally? What do you mean? You mean that MEPC helps communities? Yeah. yeah, is that through grant grant only? There's a technical assistance program, TAP grants that that are annual that that are that they go through process um, and and we you know go through process and select that the, the bicycle pedestrian plans um, process. We do a number of bicycle pedestrian plans for communities. That that's another sort of on request that we consider. Um, and then there's sort of, you know, like, like, like if you have a particular problem at a particular intersection and you want to talk to me or someone else from the transportation team, you can also reach out and, you know, if it's one or two meetings, we can easily, you know, to get special permission. You just, you know, we can be involved in, in, in looking at a particular, particular issue or project. And, you know, if it's just a couple meetings here and there, but, but if it's, if it's a, a longer study process, then, then there, there, there's, you know, asking for technical assistance is the best way to do that. Okay, that's helpful. It, he, um, Lincoln yeah. has been engaged with David and the MAPC to, uh, to help us with a bike and pedestrian plan for the last year and a half or so. And also for an experimental implementation of um, edge, edge lanes or uh, advisory shoulders. I think Lexington has a couple of installations of those on the Spring Street. State Street, sort of. It is sort of. Sort of, sort okay. Yeah. Are those the things that when I was a teenager riding my bike, you would just sort of go up and then down and it was kind of cool to like roll ramps? Is that that's what that is? That's wonderful, but it's not bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, let's do that too. <laughs> That'll start traffic. <laughs> Whee! Uh, just, these are, uh, if you look at a, a, a neighborhood road in Lincoln, there no, there's no center line. And 
cars generally drive on the right, drive on the left, maybe towards the middle. And um, what we're looking to do is to take a, uh, a relatively straight path, straight road and, and put some dotted lines along the edge to mark those edges of the road, the edge lanes as safe spots for pedestrians and, um, and bicyclists. Yep, there's, a, there's an image on the right. So are they basically sh yeah, shoulders that are, yeah, not paved? Yeah. They're not, they're not, they're not, um, you can see there's a dotted line there. And okay. so that's oh, okay. a signal, uh, yeah, it's a signal to drivers that that is a spot for the pedestrians and the bicyclists and cars have to move away from them. And when two cars are coming at each other, they will either, they're already driving with two road, two wheels in that uh, shoulder because it's safe to do so, or they just uh, you know move over as they would at any other time when they're approaching each other on a on an unmarked center line road and avoid avoid colliding. The way I describe this this treatment is that typically a roadway of this width will have perhaps will have a center line and that center line will go down the middle and, and that, that lane is wide enough for a car, but it's not wide enough for a car, a bike and a pedestrian. And so it really prioritizes the driver and that, that vehicle over anyone else because of that, that, that sort of way it's, that, that's striped. But if you, this is sort of an inverse of that, you, you're putting in that dash shoulder to accommodate the bike and the pedestrian first, and then the driver is kind of the guest and they're, they're there and they're driving down the street. But you know, if someone is in that dash lane, then they have to go around. Um, and, and, and this picture was taken last summer in a, in a neighboring state, but, but just to show this type of treatment and, and how, you know, because of so many users on this roadway at this time that that vehicle is, is moving at a pretty slow but safe rate and they're, they're able to get through just as well as everyone else on that street. So uh, yeah, so coming soon to Lincoln and hopefully more. That Very was a much better explanation. <laughs> well, well, thank you, David, very much thank for yeah. being willing to come speak to us and also to um, zeroing in on, on our area. And I, I think you've given us some, where we're not already institutionalizing um, some of the staying on top of this. Um, I, I think suggestions like that are helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, you're welcome to stay, but you're also welcome to leave. Okay. I, Have I a good day. I know Take you care. have many meetings. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think I'm going to move on now to municipal highlights. So who would like to go first? I'll go first again. No Please. risk. Nobody, nobody's okay. jumping in here. I, I, I've got some highlights to talk to you about. The um, I've, we've been, I brought up the school project a few times over the last three or four years. <laughs> well, the $95 million project started um, two fall, two springs ago, as soon as, uh, as soon as school went out, they started demolishing. And the, the project was to replace the, our school campus in the middle of town. That was a bunch of buildings, 1950s, another 1950s, 19, all the way up to 1994 and um, renovate, substantial renovation, some rebuild by cutting the, cutting the building basically in half and doing the middle school first and putting all the middle school kids over in the elementary school and the elementary school into modular classrooms on the, on the soccer field, so to speak. So that happened and the middle school, is, the middle school kids are back in the new middle school, new this September, and the elementary schools are out of their school and it's being substantially demolished and renovated. And they're in the, the uh, modules, the modular classrooms in the center of the field up front. So the, we're, it's all on target. So COVID and everything, and it's a big project and it's all on target for uh, finishing on time, which is fantastic. Is it on budget? It's on budget. Oh, wow. Well, I should, I'll say this. So it's, it's got to fit. The budget's a budget. So things had to be value engineered out of the project, which of course, some of it's gonna come back to our capital planning committee anyway. So is it on budget? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, 
and then there's a complete streets project that we have going on in town, finally. Um, the last round of complete streets we were awarded and then a pandemic hit and we had a lot of problems getting qualified buyer, but bidders, vendors to bid on the contract. But it's going on now and it's a, it's a roadside path that goes basically from the train station where the supermarket Donalands is, there's a small shopping area there, up towards those refuge islands, those uh, crosswalks that David referred to up that way. It's gonna stop at Codman Road by Codman Farm. And um, they broke ground maybe six weeks ago. It's all look like, it looks today like it's ready for pavement. It probably isn't, but to my eyes, it looks ready for pavement. So that's um, pavement and I think it's the pavement from one beginning to end. I don't think there's crushed stone in this project. Most, most, of, the pro, most of the roadside paths in Lincoln are paved. Will there and be we, through traffic? Will there, sorry to interrupt, will there be yeah. through traffic? There'll be, these roadside paths are separate. There, one looks like a sidewalk, the one that goes right in front of a gas okay. station. Okay, yeah. And then it's on the other side of a rock wall on the uh, farm side of a rock wall. Okay. Uh, and then we, I don't remember if I updated you on this last June or not, but our inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism committee, it kicked off maybe last May, last June. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And also um, Lincoln, along with uh, some of the other towns here, we were invited to appoint a representative to the state's special commission on the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution because of our proximity to Battle Road. And um, the select board recently appointed Ray Shepard to that commission. And uh, just a note on Ray, he's, yes, he lives in Lincoln and um, he is a historiographer. What he, he's an, a former school teacher of history and a former textbook editor. And what he's been doing while he's been retired is writing biographies, biographies for young adults, um, young readers, and uh, people who, uh, African-Americans who, and their allies who have helped make America a more inclusive place. Mm -hmm. And he's been focusing a lot on um, uh, war stories, American Revolution and uh, World War, and Civil War, World War One. I, I can't remember the other one, but he has a series of books. And actually he's gonna be in Concord soon at, a, at the bookstore for a talk coming up. So Ray Shepard is, is Lincoln's appointee to the special commission. Great, thank you. That's what I had. Susie, you, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I don't think I've told you most of this, but I'm like, when's the last time we met? I know. That was June and stuff did happen. So um, we finally broke ground on our center streetscape project. Um, the $10 million project to destroy the center and then make it beautiful again with the sidewalks and lighting and trees and the roadway and all that. Um, and to do some traffic calming things, some of the, not everything that people like to get into that type of plan, um, but some traffic calming. Um, so that has started, this is gonna be a two construction cycle process. Um, and they've actually been doing it in different segments in different spots. So every day they're not necessarily working in the same spot. And that's worked out pretty well in terms of traffic. Um, there've been some slight backups. Um, so that's underway. Um, we had our first uh, public forum for the 25% design process that we're going through for the Bedford Street, Hartwell Ave, Wood Street mm -hmm. corridor. That was Tuesday night. I am on that working group, but I was unable to attend the meeting because I have work meetings on Tuesday night. Um, so Emily, I don't know if you were there. I, I haven't gotten the report back of how many people I showed wasn't because I was at HVAC. I, I'm pretty sure that my colleague Margaret was there. Um, okay. So I'll expect a report on that next week. Yeah, so that, that process is underway and, and we're pretty excited with what the, our consultants have put together for this. Um, and it's challenging to get people to come out to a, a virtual meeting. Um, and so they've done the whole special virtual meeting room type thing and the, the pins on the map and all that in a, in a really kind of neat way. Um, so it's fall and in Lexington, apparently that means you have to have a special town meeting. Um, and so we are gearing up for a fully virtual special town meeting starting on November 8th. Uh, it's scheduled right now for November 8th, 9th and 10th and November 15th 
17th and 18th. I think we're supposed to have hats on the 18th. Uh, so I probably won't be at the November hats meeting. Um, and we currently have 17 articles on the agenda. Um, is it going to be outside or inside? It's virtual, completely virtual. Oh, virtual. That's right, virtual use. Yeah. Um, and there's some meaty articles on this agenda, um, including taking up some revisions to our noise bylaw in, uh, in relation to um, gas powered leaf blowers. Uh -huh. So that's coming up this fall. We have some revisions coming up to some zoning that we passed on Hartwell Ave. Uh, this time it has to do with um, net zero buildings and um, trying to remove uh, fossil fuels and incentives for different different parts of zoning that might happen there. Um, we have like, our planning board I think is trying to bring six articles, which is hard at a fall town meeting. Some of them are housekeeping, some of them are a little bit more than that. We have a neighborhood that is looking to form, I think it would be the fifth historic district in town um, to save um, a, a, a house, in a neighborhood and this is seeing both sides of people think it's wonderful to save unique neighborhoods but then other people feel that this neighborhood is acting in a somewhat entitled manner um, because it's one of our I suppose you could you could say it's one of our more affluent neighborhoods and they've all gotten together and they're pushing this forward um, and the person who's looking the developer that's looking to um, take down this very uh, this older significant home um, intends to put some affordable housing in there but really what is affordable versus attainable. So we're having that whole conversation of equity. Um, so that's going on. Our chief equity officer, just to follow up on Jonathan and his DEI work, our chief equity officer, Martha Duffield, did start for the town. She's our very first chief equity officer um, in the middle of July. And she just met with us at our select board meeting the other night and gave us her three month update of what she's been up to. And she's been very, very busy. Um, we are currently in the process of doing interviews for a, our new police chief. Um, and that they're going through that process over the next several weeks. And I think that's all I got for now. That's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It yeah. is a lot. Seems to be the uh, climate everywhere in terms oh, of. Oh, one more thing. So yes, Lexington did also get to name someone to the state's 250th commission. And so guess who it was? You. Me. Yeah. <laughs> is it really? It is. Well, it is. Because I, I also sit on our town's semi quincentennial commission. Um, and we met last night. And, you know, sometimes when, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but do you get a little like dragged down by doing all this stuff? But then meeting with the semi quincentennial commission, because right now we're in the dreaming stage, you know, like we're putting all the dreams and ideas on the table. It is energizing and exciting. Yeah. Yeah. But it's now we just have to figure out what can actually happen and how we're going to pay for it. <laughs> so right. then reality hits. But yeah. I'm, I'm sure it helps to have the same person on the three committees, the Battle Road, the Lexington, and the State Commission. Yeah, I would think so. Continuity. Yeah. You know, the state one, it's like 40, I think it's 35 to 45 people. I'm like, yeah, it's huge. I'm not sure how, how effective it's going to be. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emily, that leaves you. <laughs> that leaves me. Um, well, we are also having a fall town meeting, special town meeting. Um, ours is November 1st and it's in person. So we are meeting in the high school auditorium. Everyone will be masked. You will be separated by households. Um, the town manager sent out an email this morning to the various committees, select board, um, planning, finance and school committee to just say how many of your people are coming. So we know how to you know, set up your seats um, and we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, it's a pretty tight warrant. There's only eight articles. Most of it is just, you know, normal financial housekeeping that we ordinarily do in the fall. Um, there is one planning board article um, with some changes to our great road zoning, um, partly to enhance sort of pedestrian amenities to make it clear that like we expect some kind of, you know, sidewalk and a place for pedestrians to be. Um, one other part of that is to potentially allow for taller buildings in a couple places, um, you know, in the east end of the Great Road. Um, there are only two, I think, sites where you could have a four-story building with the right kinds of setbacks, um, but there may be some kind of knee-jerk, like, whoa, um, reaction to that. So we'll see how that goes. But 
it'll be a good experiment. Um, you know, we've done two outdoor town meetings that went really well, but it's going to be a little too chilly <laughs> in November. And we're trying to, you know, it, it, we're trying to make that balance between we want people to show up because we need a quorum of 100, but also like we don't want to be around each other in a big auditorium for a very long time. So I will be interested to see how it goes. Um, what else? Our economic development director, Elisa Sandoval, um, has left Bedford for the private sector. Um, so we're sad to see her go um, and we'll be looking to fill that position, um, which, you know, started off as a part time position. And then, you know, with Elisa in that role, um, she really just did so much and expanded to a full time job. So um, there will be big shoes to fill, but I'm confident we'll find the right person. Um, there also we've had some conversations um, with our energy and sustainability committee um, about the possibility of hiring a sustainability director or you know someone to kind of take the lead and, and be the clearinghouse for all of the net zero um, and other sustainability um, projects that are currently um, currently our facilities director um, does most of that work and he's amazing but it's a lot of it's a lot of work. So the um, argument is that having a person who's really focused on that um, would give us a lot of advantages in the long term. There's a similar position that's currently open in Arlington. So we're kind of seeing how that um, plays out as well. Um, those are the big things. We're still, all our boards and committees are still meeting by Zoom. We did invest in the OWL technology because we thought we were going to be at a hybrid stage um, by September, but we weren't. So we're going to revisit, um, the select board's going to revisit that policy um, at the beginning of December and just see where are we, where are the case counts, where are we in schools, where do we, um, you know, how does staff feel? The thing about the hybrid, um, the L technology is you need two staff members there to run it. So, you know, is there enough staff that feels comfortable being in person with whatever um, committee members are around? So we'll see. I mean, I think a lot of people still are really enjoying the virtual meeting and, and the benefits that, that we get from that. Um, certainly we've seen increased um, public participation. So that's the news from Bedford. Good. Um, speaking of sustainability, we um, our sustainability director whom we've had for several years now uh, took a job recently in the private sector. And so our new sustainability dir director is coming from the private sector and will start with us um, Soon, I think it's couple uh, August twenty fifth, if I recall. Um, Susie, I'm surprised you didn't mention the dedication of the new um, your new tour tourist information center. And so, congratulations to, to Lexington. Um, you know, this is a busy time of uh, with all the tourists, and we count on them both in a number of our communities. And um, I think Lexington and Concord did some coordinated advertisement earlier in the summer, something like that. They did. And I can say I work at Hancock Church, which is right on the Battle Green, and the buses are back. They're not back the way they were pre-COVID, but there was a week where I think we had 12 or 15 buses over the course of the day. Yeah. And great. they were like, they couldn't park, there weren't enough parking spaces and they were honking and saying unkind words to each other how, <laughs> about how the other people parked. And so it's like old times. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so weaving together both the uh, tourist theme here and DEI, um, you know, in Concord, I would say that in the last, at least the last year, um, a lot of our nonprofits have really been taking in the library, have really been taking in the schools, have really been taking the lead in terms of DEI uh, and related initiatives, either with new programming or new exhibits, for example, at the Concord Museum or uh, various forums that are, are led in town and so forth. Um, Concord is getting ready, the uh, select board is getting ready to um, launch their DEI um, commission. And this has been an interesting process because uh, it's really been generative over the last few months. And then of course, summer things slow down a little bit, but um, uh, there's been some, it's going to be interesting now to see what form it takes. The charge has been, was written in such a way that um, it left a, a great deal of latitude for the, the uh, commission itself to sort of find its own uh, voice. Uh, and uh, previous to this, however, the schools have been working on this and, and now have a DEI director in the schools. So they've been doing a, a great deal um, long before we're launching this commission. Um, 
If you haven't, uh, I'm going to give a plug to the Concord Museum only because if you haven't been over there to see all the new exhibits, mm -hmm. some related to um, the 250th, <laughs> uh, and um, there's an exhibit over there right now that I think leaves on November 7th, um, which is, um, uh, hmm. Something about opening pass, new, um, isn't that funny? I'm blocking on it right now, sorry. Um, but it, it looks at uh, uh, women who have been prominent uh, in, in uh, Concord's history and the, and quite frankly, the history in the area and brings it right up to the, the present. Um, and so that's been drawing in a lot of visitors. So um, that leaves November 7th. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, in terms of schools, um, you know, we we are in the process right now. We're just we have just more or less finishing up the feasibility and design study for the middle school that I've mentioned previous new middle school project that I've mentioned previously. Um, it's now going out to um, for a cost estimate with two different um, entities, and we are planning a special town meeting in January, um, and we know it's going to be mobbed, and it will be indoors. Uh, just because of the time of the year. And you talk about logistic uh, problems. Uh, we think we may have to be in three different venues, um, deputizing, yeah, um, uh, uh, moderators and, and, and these other. So uh, some real challenges there, but it had to do with trying to uh, meet some schedule issues here. So that's coming up. Um, and then, um, I'll just mention, uh, since it's transportation related, um, you know, this time of year, as you probably do too, have all some interesting CPA applications. And one of them is to uh, help complete the 100% design for a bridge that will go over the Assabet River, connecting the Baker Ave. Um, 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 businesses, uh, which include many of the med medical offices in that area, to West Concord Center. And um, if you can imagine that area. So um, two, 2A would, would um, be the northerly perimeter. And then uh, ComAv coming into West Concord would be the sort of the southern perimeter. Yeah. So that's, that's a, a big item. Um, uh, because then that project would go on the tip um, and um, we would seek state funds for that project, state and federal funds for that project. So that's a, a big thing in the works. And like all of you, there's a lot of other things going on, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, can, any other final comments before I move on? Yeah, uh, Susie. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is for those of you that are familiar with Lexington and the Quality Inn on Bedford Street, Quality Inn had three buildings and there used to be a margaritas there that closed. Yeah. Um, that project got rezoned at one of our prior town meetings. Um, and so now um, there, uh, there is a developer looking to there before our planning board last week um, to put in a six story life sciences or I'm not sure how big the life sciences is, but a six story parking garage with a little under 400,000 square foot life sciences building. Um, so they are before our planning board right now, and it does not have to go to town meeting since that property has been rezoned. Um, we're hearing that for our spring town meeting, most likely there's a proposal coming for um, the sports club, which is a little bit further up Bedford Street, almost at the jug handle for a similar situation for a life sciences building with some type of, some type of structured parking. And if you've ever been on the far end of Lexington down on the Waltham line, you can see we rezoned a piece of land right in front of um, Brookhaven. There were two office buildings there that were taken down and now um, they're building a life sciences building with structured parking. Um, and then the friendlies that was there, which is actually just over the line in Waltham. Um, so it makes the, the lot a little funky shaped. Um, that was torn down and that's gonna be a Chase Bank. Wow. Lots going on with life sciences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they're coming out to a number of the communities. So yeah, interesting. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the approval of the draft minutes. And thank you, Susie, for doing both the February 18th and the June 30th minutes. Uh, you set a high bar for the format. So thank you. Um, do I hear a motion? I actually had one correction to the June minutes. In the list of attendees, um, it lists Sean Hagen from Bedford, um, and it should be Steve Hagen. 
there is a Sean Hagen in Bedford. He's an art teacher, but Steve Hagen is our planning board rep too. He used to be in Lexington, I think. There I think you that's go. why I wrote Sean. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Bye. Okay, so. I, I, you... I had one a, a, adjustment too. Uh, it's about the, uh, there's a paragraph there that, and it ends with gold star family. And I just wanted to add a little bit more to that because, um, is that on the June 30th? Yeah. It's in the June 30th. Yes. Okay. And so gold star, we were awarding the Memorial day service that recognized gold star families that had not yet been recognized with mass medal of Liberty, Massachusetts medal of Liberty. The medal, the Massachusetts medal of Liberty is what we owe we um, distributed out to those families. So, so Gold Star families that had not yet been recognized with uh, the Massachusetts Medal of Liberty. Good. Thank All right. you. So with those amendments, um, do I hear a motion? I move we approve the February 18th, 2021 minutes and the June 30th, 2021 minutes as amended. Okay, second. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. And so um, roll call, I guess we have to do. Um, Jonathan? Aye, Dwyer, aye. Emily? Aye. Susie? Aye. Um, myself, aye. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, um, the meeting dates, which I did not, uh, I don't have at this point. Um, the third, does someone have a calendar in front of them? Easy access. Yeah. The third, what is the third Thursday in uh, November? The date? The 18th. That's the 18th. So, you know, and I and, will not be available that night either. I okay. probably have town meeting. Yeah. So, you know, as I said to you, um, with, even with the difficulties of setting up this meeting, um, some of us are just tapped out at this point. For eating. <laughs> it's really tough. Um, so, and then December follows. So um, any suggestions how we manage this? Do we need to stick with Thursdays? Did we wanna look at a different day the week of November 15th? Or do we wanna just punt to- I think I, think I uh, queried about the third Wednesdays, if I recall, and there was some conflict there. Susie, yeah, I, I, I currently have hats with a question mark written on November 17th. So we must've had that conversation at some point. I have town meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I'd, rather, then, I'd rather be here. Uh, yeah. And then and then, then and then the next week is um Thanksgiving, is it not? Right. Yeah. So and then December is tough, but at least uh, the, the the third week in December. How are people feeling about that? The third Thursday in December would be the 16th, and my kids have a concert. Um the first week in December is not terrible. Does that conflict? Like December 2nd? I don't know. Does... I'm wondering if that conflicts with holiday. I... It's Hanukkah week. I think Hanukkah yeah, begins. I, have a, I okay. have a summit, financial summit that night. Okay. We just meet all the time. There's something like only 16 available days to have meetings in November. We're meeting 10 of them. Wow. Yes. yes. So, um, this, I don't, I don't know how we resolve this. Do we just start again in January? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. So we it, can count on January 20th? Yeah. It's in my calendar already. See, yeah. it, says, it says hold hats. <laughs> right there in blue. Okay. okay, let's start there. I'm gonna okay. take the hold off it so I know it's, for, it's happening. <laughs> Okay. We'll we, start. Uh, do you have topics in mind already? Are we still brainstorming? Yeah, we're still brainstorming. I, you know, I got some uh, su some suggestions when I uh, queried about this uh, late summer. A DEI was one of them, as I recall. Yeah. Uh, I don't know specifically. Can, does anyone want to flush out what they're thinking about in terms of DEI resource, uh, the type of DEI resource they're looking for? I'll chip in. Um... I know all four of our towns plus the base is doing things related to DE and I, and yep. to, to compare notes about the strategy and what our committees are focused on and, 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 and even connect those individuals that are, that are working on those committees or the chairs of those committees or our staff in your towns. Um, 
Yeah, that's I think would be a plus. Do you want to shoot for that for January? Yeah. Sure. All right, definitely. The, yeah. other, the other one I thought of uh, was related to DPWs. You know how we 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 got the um, the fire departments and police departments together. Maybe it was just police. Maybe it was just, I can't remember which ones or if they were both. I think we made them both to talk about. We did both. Yeah. They, I did both. They, yeah. When I was sure. Capital. DPWs, because we're getting uh, questions around um, uh, roadway and equipment practices. So I, I heard that Lexington, setting the bar too high, perhaps, got an award for its roadways. We've gotten awards for our roadways, and we have gotten awards for like our how we do snow. So that sounds like a wonderful thing to discuss. And um, okay. the and app technology that enables people to uh, report potholes. I know Sudbury's using those. We don't and, have it that. Okay, and I, I'm wondering about that. Is that a has that been helpful? Has that been a hindrance? Um, the only it? thing I will say is, if you want my DPW guys here, <laughs> they're Not all like, of them. Well, no, but like the DPW director or the yeah. the roadway supervisor, I they struggle with evening meetings only because they start so early in the day. Hmm. Yeah, you know. So maybe we pick a different time for that day. Just a thought. Yeah. Do people anyway. have do, do people have a flexibility for an earlier meeting like at four? I do. Yeah. I mean, if I know far enough in advance, yeah. Yeah, we're early in the morning, even eight. I gotta walk the dog and have my coffee. You gotta you gotta give me that. <laughs> Well, also to be fair to them, you know, if they've just gotten in and they, they've got to deal with whatever they walk into for the day. Yeah, yeah. Sure. True. Yeah. yeah. And four may even be um, too late because they, a lot of them are starting at seven or earlier. Do yeah. 30 quitting time. Yeah. So do you, do you want a, a presentation on our, our, I'll tell you what, I'll send you all uh, a little description of what I thought, what I think might be interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'll ask them what time would work yeah. for them. Okay. Okay. Let's start with that. See what we can do to line up people for the January timeframe for DEI yep. uh, from our surrounding towns, uh, maybe even outside of our own towns, uh, depending okay. on who's available and what we can do. Yeah. Uh, okay. So where do I send the, the updated minutes to who posts those? So this is, this was going to be my question. Yeah. Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll maintain the, the site. Okay, that. so I'll make those changes to June and then send them to you. That'd be great. Okay, okay. and so for Jeremy, who is now um, managing these recordings, um, he would send the recording to you for you to up upload, or how does that work? What I've done is um, I assume that Concord has a facility or repository where they make their videos available. I'll just go over there and grab the link and post the link on the hat site. So, so, so Jonathan, this will be available uh, both on YouTube and also I can just send you the uh, the Zoom link with the recording as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, good. Um, good. Um, I failed to put on the agenda public comment. Um, is there anyone who would like to make a public comment? And we thank you. I see Linda Miller is here. Thank you for being here. Did she, Would you like to make any comment? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting meeting on um, transportation, biking, and uh, we'll try and, uh, I don't know what the planning board can do with that, but that was very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Um, Thank you, everyone. And again, thank you, Jeremy, for helping set this up for Concord. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, and, and interesting meeting. Thank you. Good to see all of you. We, we didn't actually do the roll call vote to adjourn, though, right? That's correct. We still yes. have to do that. I'm a yes. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. Although, you know, there's different uh, legal opinions about this at this point. But uh, Whether you I'll, need it for adjournment? Yeah, exactly. But I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan? Aye. Emily. Hi. Susie already said I. Yes. And, and myself, I. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Um,